Welcome to Wikipedia Radio. I'm your host, Pastor Sam. Wikipedia Radio is sponsored by Equipping the Persecuted, and we want to hear from you. So contact us at contactwikipedia at gmail.com. Once again, that's contactwikipedia at gmail.com. Now, this show is sponsored by Equipping the Persecuted. You can find out more about Equipping the Persecuted at equippingthepersecuted.org. Now, I normally tell you a little bit about equipping the persecuted, but instead of doing that today, we are going to be talking to a man, not just any man, a pastor who has been to Nigeria more than once now, right? You've been there twice. Twice, two times. And they let him out both times. One time it was a little bit iffy whether or not they're going to let him out. But, But I don't know, maybe we'll get into that, maybe we won't. But we're going to be joined today by Pastor Dan Sawyer of Victory Church World right. Outreach in, I have no idea how to say the town, Florida. Where, 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 where's your church at there, Pastor It's Dan? in Apopka, Florida, which is northwest of Orlando. So we, we got normal names like <clears throat> like Hudson and Waterloo in Iowa. We, we don't make up words like that down in Florida. Mm. But no, no, you do, go, you do serve in just a wonderful, wonderful church down there in Florida. And one of the things you, you have been involved in is equipping the persecuted in the ministry there. What have you done a couple times that you've gone down there? Sure. So thanks, thanks, uh, Pastor Sam, for having me on here. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been doing missions for uh, quite some time. I've been ministry for, I guess, about 30, 32 years. And I've gone to the mission field, uh, Central South America, several places. I went to Haiti right after the earthquake, took a team there. That was pretty, pretty devastating. Um, but as far as Nigeria, it's just interesting with that because um, there's something, uh, probably 10, 12 years ago at least, the Lord as I was driving, driving down in my truck, driving down the road, the Lord just laid on me, just the spirit of the Lord came on me and he told me that I was going to be traveling and it was going to be somewhere significant because I've traveled a lot, but this was really important. And, but the Lord never told me where, what it was going to be at the time. It just let me know. And so I prayed for it for like a period of 10, 12 years. And it's interesting because, uh, when, uh, when I ran into Judd and I talked to Judd and then he invited me to come to Nigeria the first time, uh, I was praying about it. And then I talked to my pastor, um, uh, that's that's over me and the Lord there at Victory Church, and, it, and when when I told him where we were going, he said, "Oh my goodness!" He said, "I've been praying over that part of Africa, the the continent of Africa, for at least ten years." Wow. He had specifically been praying over Nigeria, and he didn't know why either. But the Lord specifically directed him to pray for that. So obviously, it was easy decision for him and for me. I knew there was something big coming up. I didn't know when, what, or when, but it really felt like this was it. Uh, like this was very significant, not just any mission trip. And I, and I don't like to go to mission trips just to go to mission trips. I like to do it to really be effective. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so Judd invited me to go. We took our first trip back uh, in early December, which was interesting. So, uh, and that was, was that December 2020? December, or I think it was 2021. Yeah, it was just, yeah, 2021. Man, that, you went like back to back, like right away. I did, I did. So, yeah. so you must have enjoyed it there in Well, Nigeria. so not so much the first time. Well, the first part of the trip I did, but actually, I don't, I don't know, most people haven't heard the story, but I'm actually the guy that Judd Saul left in Nigeria. He actually left. The day we were supposed to leave, we had, you know, we had to take tests, the COVID test to get out of uh, Nigeria, and mine came back positive. So Judd left and went home all by himself and, and just left me there naked and cold and <laughs> without any food and any place to stay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what a yeah. terrible person, you know? Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, 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 you obviously did get to come back. I did get to come back, yeah. But it, but it was after I, he, he had to fight his way out. Yes. You, you took a butter knife, and I mean, it was like Rambo. Yeah. No, no, that's yeah. not really I what took happened. a spoon to the airport and threatened everybody unless they let me on the plane that I would use it. No, that's not what happened. But yeah. I did I did finally get out. I was extended for 10 days. I was there by myself. Judd had to go home. He actually didn't want to go, but we made him go. His wife wasn't feeling well, and, and me and Judd were the only ones that had gone this time, so it was just two of us. So I, I sent him home. Uh, they left me there with some medical aid, and, of course, I was in the hands of the Nigerian pastors. But it was funny because... Uh, it was obviously wasn't what I expected. I mean, it was a little devastating to know that you're, you know, you're not going home right away. And, and we had already been there for 13 days and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it home for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and I have a family and, and you know, I love my family. Um, 
But but immediately when I went to prayer, the Lord encouraged me right away. And he said, listen, I, I didn't do this to you. The, the, devil, the devil set this up, but I knew that it was going to happen. And God just told me basically, he said, listen, you're basically on a special forces mission for the next 10 days. I put you here to do spiritual reconnaissance, to do prayer, to do intercession, to, uh, to set up spiritual signposts for this na- nation for things in the years to come. And so that was my assignment, not knowing. My original assignment was to go and, 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 and with Judd and, and visit the IDP camps and hold pastor's conferences, which we, we can talk about that in a minute. And, uh, but that was, my, that was the real assignment. It was like top secret. And so that's what I did for those 10 days, mostly in the hotel room by myself, sometimes with some of the other Nigerian pastors. Uh, we prayed and interceded. And I, I'm a Florida boy, so forgive my English, but I like to say I stomped a du- mud hole in the devil's butt and walked it dry. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That, no, that, I mean, that really is a, you know, the, an important part of ministry is prayer. We, we will never go further than what we pray. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, it is one of those things where you look at this and you look at a missions uh, trip and you look at all of this. What a special ministry. I'm sure that's not necessarily the circumstances that sure, you want to be in, but sure. sometimes God allows us to go into other circumstances uh, in order so that we can turn to him and we can turn and pray and just see him work in incredible yeah. ways. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, just before we get to the pastor's conference, you mentioned this <clears throat> IDP camp. Now, that stands for, if I remember right, the Internally Displaced Persons. That's correct. Now, can you tell our listeners, what is it like to minister in an IDP camp? What is it like to be there in an IDP camp? So the first one that we visited uh, um, was was pretty traumatic and pretty rewarding all at the same time. The first IDP camp that we went to, actually, while we're there, our whole plans are fluid. We have plans. We don't tell everybody our plans. We just kind of, you know, and we have armed security with us the whole time. It's a very dangerous place, by the way. By the way, Nigeria is the most dangerous place in the world for Christians. And you don't hear a lot wow. about it a lot on the news. They don't talk about it. Uh, actually, uh, I think it was Pastor Eileen just mentioned this morning that last year, 80% of Christians that were martyred in the whole world were martyred in Nigeria. And again, we live in the nice, fluffy United States of America. We don't even, we don't even know what being martyred. When we talk about being martyred, we, we look back at, you know, 15th century, 3rd century, and, you know, the early disciples. But martyrs, martyrdom still happens today, and it's going on in Nigeria at a massive rate. And there's not a lot of help for those people. So the government's doing what they can, I guess. And, you know, everybody has opinions about that. But I don't want to throw the Nigerian government under the bus because I, I want to go back there, you know. And, and the police department, they have their hands full. And... Uh, but uh, but the Christians are the ones we should be the ones that should be helping them out more than anybody, right. you know. And, and, and what is that living standard like in those IDP camps? Is it, you know, oh. five star hotel, three star? Yeah, absolutely, hotel? man. It is so cushy. I'm telling you, you know, Donald Trump would be very, very comfortable there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so the, the, the lifestyle that well, first of all, the nation of Nigeria um, is the third, uh, the third. How do I want to say this? Not the third poorest country, but the third uh, most, they have the third most pop, most poverty, sorry, <laughs> the third highest poverty rate uh, in the world. Wow. So out of all the nations in the world, they're number three for the highest poverty rate. And that's, that's you know, that's their regular style of living. The IDP camp, what an IDP camp, again, the IDP stands for uh, internally displaced persons. An IDP camp is, it's, it's so foreign to me because it's, you know, it's like abortion. You know, how does a mom kill their own child when that's totally against their nature? Well, here I am in a country where they're killing their own people. It should be totally against their nature. But these are people that are refugees, not from another country, from their own country, Mm -hmm. because the the Muslim population there, they they don't typically the average Muslim, they don't do the killing themselves, but they will hire Fulani herdsmen and the Boko Haram to go out and terrorize the Christian villages. And so they'll go into a village uh, and this happens quite frequently, quite frequently. This is not years and years and years ago. It's happening all the time. They go into a village late at night uh, with machetes and machine guns. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be too graphic, but they kill, they murder, murder, they maim, they burn all the houses down and they run all the Christians out of the village. Wow. And so what happens is the the ones that are left alive that didn't get caught, that didn't get chopped up and shot up, um, uh, they're left alive and they are taken and they're put in a refugee camp, usually hours, several hours is very far from you know the, the village where they're used to growing up and so that's what an idp camp and so the people that are living there are the the adult males that are left which is usually the fewest of the population because that's who they target first 
and then you have children, little children that are left, and most of those don't have a mother or a father, and they, some of them have even seen their, their siblings you know, murdered in front of their own eyes. And so that's what you come upon when you go to an IDP camp. Um, the first IDP camp that we went to, um, it, it was very interesting because we, we were, had a, several things that were, we were doing uh, throughout the week. And then this one day, we actually found out about this, this one IDP camp, I think that day or the day before. It was the day before. And we hadn't heard of it before. But we just learned about it. And when we learned about their, their plight, we said, hey, you know what? We're going to make a trip over there and we're going to bring some supplies. And, and um, so, we, so what was supposed to happen was there was supposed to be word was put out from our people to their people to let them know that we knew they were there and we were coming to help. So we drove, and of course, when, when we drove, you know, we're in Jeeps and trucks, and, and, and we're on these dirt roads with huge, huge potholes, and it's just, you know, I mean, it's bearing down on your kidneys and your liver and everything, you know, an hour and a half, two hours to get back there, and they're at, back there in the middle of nothing, and um, we pull up to the IDP camp, and, and we haven't gotten inside yet. We pull up to the front, and when we get up to the front, we're like two or three vehicles of us, and again, we have a couple armed security guards, and our vehicles are full of supplies, and there's me and Judd, and then uh, we have several of the Nigerian pastors, none of which these people in the IDP camp have met yet, and we have several of the local Nigerian pastors. And as we pull up outside the camp, there's a truck with the hood up, and there's two uh, two got two males outside of the truck and uh, a couple of our we found out one of those was actually the chief of the idp camp they were the chief of the village okay and so a couple of the we me and judd and the security guards we stayed in the truck and uh, uh a couple of the nigerian pastors they got out of the truck went over and started talking to these guys and right away the chief who was a, a big fella he's like my size he was you could tell he was angry mm-hmm and the truth is he was scared, but it looked like anger. But he was yelling, he was screaming, he was waving his hands, and he was just saying, go away, go away, go away. And we were trying to tell them, you know, trying to, and so apparently the message did not get relayed that we were coming. He didn't know who we were. The reason why the truck was there in front of the camp was because the Fulani herdsman had shot bullet holes through the truck trying to get to him the day before. And so the truck was disabled and they were trying to fix the truck. Wow. And so, so we pulled up. But as far as we were concerned, when we pulled up we, to them, we were perfect strangers. And yeah. they didn't know we were just more terrorists and we were coming to do more harm. And, and of course, little did they know, you guys had beautiful feet that was bringing the message of good yeah. news. Yeah, but we, it took Christ. us an hour, at least an hour to convince him of that. Exactly. So through a lot of discussion with the pastors and finally they, they talked this man off the cliff and he calmed down a little bit and he finally decided to let us in the village and we were able to go in the village and uh, again that was the first trip so uh, we got inside there and we were able to deliver the supplies and we spent some time with them and we blessed them uh, 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 we, I passed out candy to the kids we have videos of all this stuff and of course then we promised them some things they didn't have running water in the village uh, wow. They didn't have a toilet, which they actually we're working on that now, the, the, the working toilet. Uh, but they had no water, so they would have to basically travel hours somewhere, which, again, wasn't safe to get water and then bring it back into the village. So Judd did something that was amazing to me because this is fir my first time with him. Uh, he promised the, the chief of the village, he said, within 30 days, you're going to have a well in this IDP camp. Yeah. And I looked at Judd like he was crazy. Yeah, because you know? I mean, it's not like the hadn't been raising funds or, yeah. or, or anything like that. Yeah. And it's not, you know, equipping the persecuted, pretty much whatever go, comes in, it immediately goes out. That's yeah. that's kind of how equipping the persecuted runs. So it was really a step of faith. Yeah, it really was. And I was amazed. But by the end of the day, Judd already had that donor to supply that well. And I was just shocked. In fact, I think within by the end of that day or the next day, he had two or three of them donated. And so we were able to do that. And I was able to come back in April and actually see the well, put my hands on the well. And we came back and we vis visited the camp and they were doing much better. And they were so thankful that we came when we came back in April. They did tribal dances for us and we just had a great time. And uh, a member of my church, actually, I, I was able to purchase a cow on my first visit for $500. And for $500 at that time, of course, now you know there's inflation, um, you could purchase a cow and that would basically feed a whole village which when, wow. when I went was Christmas. So basically I was given a whole IDP camp, a cow for Christmas, and that would be the only beef that they would probably eat all year or wow. until somebody else did that. So these IDP camps, they're just hurting, hurt yeah. people who yeah. are broken. They've been removed from their homes. Yeah. They're scared. Yeah. Uh, they're still being terrorized. Yes. And of course, many of these are, are Christians or at least come from Christian families. Yes. And so they need the word of God and they need the encouragement of the word of God. And yes. that's what you guys were able to bring to that. Yes. But I want to change gears just a little bit. Can you tell our listeners about what you guys have done 
with this pastor's conference. I know you came back a second time. You might have had the pastor's conference the first time, too. I can't both remember. Both times. Both times. Both times. So <coughs> you've been Excuse able me. to participate in this here, this pastor's mm. conference, both times. What is happening with the Nigerian pastors? How are you guys training them up, I- encouraging them and equipping them uh, to serve there in Nigeria? Sure. So that's a great question, Pastor Sam. So that was really my main assignment was to go and, and do the pastors conference. Obviously, seeing these kids and seeing the camps and seeing the, some of these and seeing the the widows of, of of murdered police officers and murdered pastors and, and there's a lot of things that we got to do. But my main assignment was to go and do the pastors conference, being a pastor. And I was kind of <coughs> excuse me, I was kind of overwhelmed by that. But as I prayed and really sought the Lord before the trip, um, I and I talked to Judd a little bit and I felt like the Lord really wanted me to deal with the spirit of what we call pietism. Mm-hmm. which is actually prevalent in the United States of America. <laughs> Absolutely. And But me not knowing Nigeria, because I hadn't been there. Typically, when I do missionary work, I like to go and, I mean, I, I, use, I go and preach, but I try not to say a whole lot as far as their culture and try not to teach them too many things other than what the gospel says. Um, because you, when you don't know their culture and you don't know how they live and wh- what their lifestyle is, you don't really, I feel like you don't have a right to speak to them. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it was kind of awkward for me because I don't really know much about them. Uh, one of the beautiful things that I found that was amazing because as many times as I've preached in the mission field, when you preach in the mission field, it usually can be it can be quite challenging because usually you're in a country where they speak a different language. Right. Well, I found out when I got to Nigeria and I was prepared for this when I even when I prepared my notes, I found out when I got to Nigeria that they actually speak perfect English, Sam. Good. In fact. They speak better English than we do, especially me, because I'm from Florida, because <laughs> they were taught by the British. So they, they speak perfect English, so you don't need an interpreter, so you don't lose your train of thought. You can continue talking, so it's wonderful. But they just, they're just they just a wonderful people. What I found with the Nigerian, that they were so respectful, so honorable. So it's not like, you know, because we hear a lot of things about Nigeria, you know, Nigeria, all the scandal and all the things that go on. And, and a lot of that's because of the economy, the state of their economy. You know, they're, sometimes they're, they're people just doing what they can do to get by to make money, you know. Um, but when you actually go there and you meet these people, you find a very honorable people, a very, very sweet, very tender hearted, very humble people. And they're, and they're ready to listen to everything that we have to say. And they're watching everything that we do. That's right. So it's really important. It's like with your children. You know, you have to be careful what you say and what you do because somebody's watching you, you know. That's right. And so so I really felt the Lord told me to deal with the spirit of pietism. And so I did that. It was my introduction to them, their introduction to me. But I'm kind of like, you know, so I kind of like, you know, you started at the introduction. I kind of went all the way back into Genesis and 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 talked about, you know, how, you know, God gave Moses the law and also how God uh, not only the Ten Commandments, which is our which should create our worldview, our biblical worldview, you know, and our moral standards and our civic, civic standards, but also about Exodus, Exodus 18, 21. I just touched on that a little bit because because you got to go real deep into that, but just shared about how God also gave us the standard for, for civil office, the, the minimum yep. standards. And you guys talked about this in an earlier segment. And so we show them that. And then what I do is I, 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 I try to unravel this this blindfold that they've had because the nigerians have been taught especially the nigerian christians have been taught not to have anything to do with politics because politics is evil so they discourage their people to be involved in politics they discourage to be involved in business i haven't gotten really down to what is what is the motive behind that as far as the you know ecclesiastical motives you know but but um but obviously it's 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 um uh, it's counterproductive, you know? And so right. what I do is I show them, take them all the way from the old Testament, all about how God was involved in government, how God set up government, how God set, how God set the standards for government. And then we go into the new Testament and talk about Jesus and his political activity. You know, Jesus was a political activist. Yeah. Everything yeah. he said just about was very politically motivated. Amen. It was, it was. <laughs> it was so much so, and including you know, the Great Commission where Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So I know that, um, uh, so I, I taught them about, you know, what Jesus said about being salt and light. And I told them about the Great Commission. And basically, in, in a nutshell, I told them if, if they're not being involved, if the pastors are not training, first of all, giving their people a biblical worldview. And then finding which one of their members are are gifted and anointed to be involved in politics and business and encourage that and not discourage that. Amen. And if they're they're not doing that, then what they've done is they've actually taken the Great Commission and made it the Great Omission. That's right. Well, well, Pastor Dan, I, I just thank you so much for the work that you've done in Nigeria. 
And I mean, not just uh, to to the people there, like you said, there you, you blessed an entire village with a My great goodness. Christmas meal. And of course, with that, you, it's opening doors to share the gospel and to encourage them with the word of God. But you've also gone and trained up pastors tell them that they, they do need to get involved in politics, which is something that's important, something that we always stand for here at, at Wikipedia Radio. Uh, but you've really done this with the true heart of Christ, wanting to see people get saved and wanting to, to really share the love of Jesus Christ with them. It's, it's not because you're just trying to push people around or anything like that. It's because no. you're just showing your heart, sharing your Amen. heart with them. Amen. And, you know, I, I think that everyone who's listening should consider joining and partnering with Equipping the Persecuted, because there is not another ministry like this on the earth. And you can find out more at equippingthepersecuted.org. Once again, that's equippingthepersecuted.org. Well, thank you, Pastor Dan. My Thanks pleasure. for listening today. Thank you for having me. And have a great day. All right. God bless you. God bless you. What you just listened to was an interview that I was able to do with Pastor Dan Sawyer, uh, now, of course, who has gone and taken a few mission trips with Equipping the Persecuted. Now, Equipping the Persecuted is very, very important to us over at Wikipedia Radio. Now, it's not just because uh, we believe in their ministry, we believe in their mission, but it's because the president of Woke, or excuse me, of Equipping the Persecuted is also the director of Enemies Within the Church and really the one who has put together um, Wikipedia Radio, and of course, Equipping the Persecuted is also our sponsors, so we would suggest and really encourage you to go and to donate to Equipping the Persecuted, but not just because they sponsor the radio show, but because they actually do an incredible ministry there in Nigeria, one that uh, most people are not aware of and, and one that uh, most people are not even doing. But of course, that does want me to go and give a shout out to Enemies Within the Church. Enemies Within the Church is a documentary that goes and exposes the woke and how the social justice gospel, the false gospel of social justice, that is, has gone and infiltrated the churches across the United States and really across the world as well. Uh, and we're going to have more about that, just a little bit of a teaser for something that's coming soon, that it's not just in the United States, that it's also across the world, and that means that we need to have some ministry across the world, especially when it comes to Wikipedia. so stay tuned for more on that. But you do need to go and check out Wikipedia, and uh, you can find that at enemieswithinthechurch.com. Once again, it's enemieswithinthechurch.com. You can go there, go to the front tab, and once you go uh, up there and scroll over just a little bit, and you'll see Wikipedia. You can click on that. You can find all kinds of articles and content that we have there. You can also find links to our, our radio show and to our podcast, and, and you can see all kinds of wonderful things. But this is, this is the first uh, interview in a series of interviews that we're able to do at a conference in Sioux City, Iowa, here this this last, uh, actually about two weeks ago now at this point in time. Uh, but we've got all kinds of great content that's going to be coming out from this conference. And uh, I think that you're just going to really want to, to buckle in and, and see what comes from this. But I do want to just give you a couple of quick updates on Wikipedia, what's going on here at enemieswithinthechurch.com uh, and Wikipedia specifically. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to a couple of articles. The first one that I want to draw your attention to is Social Justice and the Gospel, Part 1, Who is the Oppressed? Now, uh, this is just a, a really important article for you to go and to, to really see. If you're, if you're struggling to see, maybe you go and you say, you know, I, I politically see what's wrong with social justice, but, but I just don't understand what's wrong theologically. In, in what these woke pastors, what these woke preachers, really these low, woke hirelings are doing, and how they're going and, and changing the gospel, what's the big deal, how they're changing it? Well, it, this article really starts off, and it tells you, it gives you a real foundation for what the real gospel is, but then it goes and it shows you where social justice starts to go off. And of course, where they start to go off in this is that they venture off into left field by going and changing who the oppressed is in the gospel narrative. They get the wrong person 
in who is oppressed in the gospel narrative. Now, of course, we know the gospel narrative, well, the real gospel is the biblical gospel, the authentic gospel, the true gospel. The only gospel that saves is that Jesus Christ came down, he died on the cross for our sins, and this is important. He died on the cross for our sin. Sin is it is lawlessness. It's the breaking of the law. It's transgression against the law. And Jesus Christ came down and he died for that. He who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, because he is God, he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ died for our sin. He was the one who was oppressed. He was the one who was afflicted. And social justice gets this totally wrong. They go and they say, you are the one who's oppressed. You are the one who's afflicted. And this is important to point out, even when we're going and looking at the ministry of Nigeria and, and, and equipping the persecuted, even equipping the persecuted understands this. They're dealing with those who literally have their family members killed. Some of them, I mean, there, there are videos of little children and pictures, I should more and say, videos of interviews of these little children who have been uh, literally, you know, tried to be murdered by being hacked by machetes, and maybe they've seen their parents next to them go and, and die right in front of their eyes. And yet, equipping the persecuted understands this, that they're not the ones who are oppressed in the gospel narrative. It is Jesus Christ who is oppressed in the gospel narrative. And of course, he was buried, proving he was dead, and he rose again on the third day to provide a way of salvation for all who would believe. And so that, that first article is Social Justice and the Gospel, Part 1, Who is Oppressed? And of course, the, the, the next one that I want you to, to go and to check out over at enemieswithinthechurch.com, you can go to content.enemieswithinthechurch.com to find Wikipedia. And that is Social Justice and the Gospel, Part 2, and that is Where Should We Focus?, See, and this is really where uh, the, the woke people really go off into uh, really a false area, is that they put the wrong focus. Instead of going in and focusing in on Jesus Christ coming down and saving people, and this is a faithful saying, says the Apostle Paul, that Jesus Christ to sa- came to save sinners, among whom I am chief, is what the Apostle Paul says. Now we know this was his purpose. Jesus Christ said that the Son of Man, that's who he is, he has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus Christ came down for a specific purpose. Now this doesn't mean that we shouldn't go and pay attention to people's bodies, because that's what they, they, they like to go and say, the woke people, they like to go and say, look, you don't care about people's uh, bodies. Now I do believe that bodies are attached to souls, amen, praise the Lord for that. But of course we need to go and to find our answers within the Word of God, and ultimately we are pointing people to Jesus Christ. We're not trying to sneak Jesus in, we're trying to make Jesus the main focus of what we do when it comes to ministry. He becomes the focal point, and he came to save us from our sin. In really, social justice in the gospel, part two, uh, where should, should we focus, really does go and focuses in on this. But before we close up here with Wikipedia Radio, I do want to also mention that we are looking for sponsors. And so if you are interested in sponsoring a radio show, which by the way, our radio show, it, it is it is growing. In fact, it looks like I, I don't want to spoil I don't want to spoil the surprise, but it looks like we're going to be expanding significantly. In fact, more than doubling our radio stations is what it's looking like. No promises. But that, that's what it's looking like. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that comes through and everything. Uh, but if you're interested in sponsoring a, a radio program across the United States, going in and advertising on this, you're saying, you know what, I'm conservative. I don't want to give my money to a woke entity. I want to go and to give my money to Christian conservatives who are going to speak the truth, who are going to go and stand up for what is right. I want to go and partner with them. Contact, contact us at wokipediamedia at gmail.com. Once again, it's Wikipedia media at gmail.com, W-O-K-E-P-E-D-I-A-M-E-D-I-A at gmail.com. Contact us there. We want to go and talk to you. But thank you for listening to Wikipedia Radio. Wikipedia Radio is sponsored by Equipping the Persecuted. Once again, contact us at media at gmail.com. Thank you for listening today. Keep standing for the truth.